Hello there, I'd like to tell you about my Tronxy X5SA Pro. I've talked about Tronxys before over the years, I've owned several of them, and I've had this one for about two years now, and I've just about finished modifying it. It's actually working really well at this point, so I thought I'd take you on a little tour around its features. I suppose I hope to inspire any of you who have this printer already, or perhaps you're considering buying one of these printers, and you want to know, does it work well? Can I make it work well? And the answer is yes, you can. So I'll show you what I've done to this one, and I'll show you why I like it. Okay, so the first thing you'll see is that it's in an enclosure, and I built this myself using something called twin wall, which is a corrugated polycarbonate material. The air gap in between the layers helps to keep the heat inside the enclosure. So the heat from the heat bed will be trapped inside and keep the print environment nice and warm and dry, which is very useful when you're printing PETG or temperature sensitive filaments. The front of the enclosure is simply attached to the frame. The sides are attached using the standoffs, and these allow the sides to clear the moving print carriages. Now, the top of the front is hinged, and then the top is also hinged. And so this allows us to leave just the front open for when we want to print using PLA or, or something that doesn't require an enclosure. And then when, when we need to do a total rebuild, we can open the top and lean it against the wall and it's completely out of the way. Now, of course, you might say, why on earth would you want to do a total rebuild? It is a Tronxy after all. If you've ever owned one of these, you'll know what I mean. There's always something, well, there was always something that required attention. It turns out that once you've fitted good quality belts and once you've got everything square and done up tight, this is actually pretty reliable. I haven't had to do much work on this at all. The Tronxy wheels, some of them were a bit tight and a little bit knobbly. It was possible to just loosen them off a little bit and get them running perfectly smooth. Occasionally you do need to clean dust off the rails. That's another reason to have an enclosure. It helps to keep the mechanicals dust free. Now obviously the biggest change is this hot end. This is something called a Mellow NF Sunrise. It's a direct feed extruder built on a CNC machined aluminium core. It has a quick release lever, which I'm not going to pull obviously because it's printing, but this quick release lever disengages the drive gears and allows you to pull the filament out or push the filament in manually. And I find that much easier than having to command the drive motor to pull the filament in or, or back the filament out. It's just easier to do it by hand. Now the drive gears themselves are a Bond Tech type, which means that it's basically two specially designed gears that mesh and they drive the filament from both sides. So you can see one of the gears here and then the gear behind it is also driving the filament. And that greatly enhances the reliability of the filament drive, especially at higher speeds. So the NF Sunrise bolts onto the standard mounting holes used for the original hot end. Now the original hot end also has a Bowden tube and so first glance you might think, oh, what's the difference? Well, there's a big difference. The direct drive extruder feeds the filament directly to the hot end. The, the distance between the feed gears and the melt zone is only a centimetre or two. The original printer uses a gear extruder pushing the filament through the long tube. And that's like pushing a rope uphill. You never get the accuracy that you need for um, good quality prints. And you would always see stringing, for example, where the filament tension continues and so the filament continues to ooze from the nozzle as the nozzle is traveling across the print. So stringing was always a problem with the standard setup. So I recommend getting away from it and going to a direct drive setup. I've relocated the filament roll on the frame where it's inside the enclosure. That helps keep it warm and dry. Gives me somewhere to mount the filament sensor and the bracket I designed for that I've actually put on Thingiverse along with the brackets that I've used in making my enclosure. Now the print surface I'm using is the Tronxy coated glass. I know a lot of people hate this surface, but I find it treats me really well. When the surface cools down, the prints pop free and there's no need to clean the bed or scrub anything between prints. It's happy to just print over and over again. And it's a nice smooth finish, so it gives a nice finish to the bottom of prints. Now it requires the use of the black sensor uh, if you get the Tronxy sensor, that is, you will have the black one rather than the original blue one. That's because the original blue one is inductive, so it will only sense a steel sheet like the magnetic steel sheet I was using before, or it will sense the aluminium print bed, which is, of course, 
supplied with a sticker. And you want to get away from that. The stickers are useless. The parts stick to them far too strongly and the sticker will get damaged in very short order as you're having to scrape and, and, and scratch to remove the parts from the print surface. Now the Tropsy sensor is not perfect. The biggest problem with it, like with any of the inductive or capacitive sensors, the Tromsey sensor is temperature sensitive, which means its measurement will differ according to how warm it is. So you get around this by preheating the printer. Always home the printer, then set the bed to, in this case, 110 degrees. And by the time the bed has warmed up, so has the sensor. And that means when it homes again and starts the print, it will be accurate. And so I found in this way that the sensor has always treated me well. It's always been accurate enough. So that's the main thing to be aware of with the Troxy capacitive sensor. What other changes have I made? Well, the very first change, the most important change of the lot, is this Z-Sync belt at the bottom. It links the two steppers together that drive the bed up and down. Now, I don't know why Troxy don't supply this with the printer. Maybe they do now, but they supply it as a kit anyway. It's not expensive. And so linking the two screws means you have far fewer bed levelling problems. Basically, you only need to level the bed once and then it retains that setting simply because the two sides stay in sync. Now I've doubled up the bearings here, which has the effect of stabilising the bed carriage. It just reduces the wobble. So does reinforcing the corners of the frame. I recommend these aluminium alloy uh, strengthening brackets. You can use plastic ones, but I think the aluminium is more effective. And I've also fitted some anti-backlash nuts. And they just increased the friction slightly, and, and that prevented a problem where the bed would tend to drop more on one side than the other. Although, of course, linking the screws together solves the same problem. I've also drilled holes in the moving parts, but this is not essential. This is just to try and extract that last bit of speed when you are printing speeds over 100 millimeters a second. You really want all the moving parts to be as lightweight as possible. Now, speaking of which, when we print at high speeds, we start to see problems like the ringing or the oscillations that you see on the sides of the X here. So I hope you can see that a little bit hard to catch in the light perhaps. But uh, we've also got some layer shifting going on at the top where the stepper motors simply couldn't keep up and there were missed steps. So how do we solve these problems? Well, the answer is clipper. So clipper allows you to use something called an accelerometer, which is the same type of chip found in most mobile phones and tablets these days. It's not expensive, it's just a, a little electronic chip. And this is connected up to the Raspberry Pi that's running Clipper. And you mount the accelerometer on the print carriage. I designed this bracket, that's also on Thingiverse. And the Raspberry Pi is effectively bypassing the printer's original control board. So the printer's original controller is still interfacing to the stepper motors and everything that's inside that box there. Apart from changing the fan several times, I recommend ball bearing fans. Get yourself some good quality ball bearing fans, such as the Pengda brand, and you won't have to change that fan again after that. So standard control board, but with Raspberry Pi and Clipper plugged into it. And so the input shaper feature lets you measure the resonances and then make a setting of what's called an input shaper function, which modifies the movement to avoid triggering those resonances. I hope I'm explaining that reasonably clearly. Basically, we've used the accelerometer to measure what resonates in this particular printer, and then we've modified the controller so that the movements are carefully tuned to avoid exciting those resonances. And in this way, the printer can print with a lot less vibration. There's absolutely, well, there's not absolutely no movement of the frame, but there is much less than there would be without using input shaping. So input shaping is a great way of compensating for any flex in the frame and any mass in the moving parts causing vibration. Now, you won't always get 100 millimeters a second printing. It depends on the size of the print features, obviously. And your settings in your slicer, such as Cura, will make a lot of difference here. So tweaking those settings will allow you to get the prints as smooth as possible. And you'll get really nice finish and really consistent results. 
Okay, so the first modification then was the sink belt. The second modification was a direct drive hot end. The third modification was setting up clipper. Now you don't have to do it with a touch screen. A lot of people control it using their mobile phone or some other device uh, with the web server that's built in. I'm using something called Mainsail and that was easy to set up and it also allows me to use a webcam. I'm using a Logitech webcam here on a mounting I designed, which is also on Thingiverse. And thus you can actually start the print remotely. And I've even written a macro, which when the print is finished, it waits for the bed to cool down and then it sweeps all the prints off the bed and allows us to start printing again. So this is really a very versatile setup. And what have I been doing lately with it? Well, I fit it with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle using a thing called a volcano heat block, which is just a bigger heat block with the cartridge, the heat cartridge arranged vertically. And this gives us a flow of about 27 millimeters cubed per second, which equates to a print speed of 100 millimeters per second with a 0.8 nozzle. And that allows me to print something like this in three hours. So this is a 305 millimeter square. Now this particular one is a reject because of a temperature problem that caused the top surface to be rough. So um, they're not all like this. And this makes good use of the Tronxy's large print area. I produced this part for a, a, a local company. So over the years, I've been through a number of different hot ends. I mean, this is the pile of carnage left over from previous modifications. And in particular, this thing here is a mosquito clone. Now, I wish it were a genuine mosquito. It would probably work quite well then. The problem with the clone was that it had quite a lot of ooze. So when not printing, there'd be a lot of filament coming out of the nozzle. Now, I was using it with this, what I thought was a dual gear extruder. I now know that this is not really dual gear. It's, well, it's two gears, yes, but they're just pressing against one side of the filament each. So it's quite easy for these to slip. So I don't really recommend this type of extruder anymore. The stepper I was using was quite heavy and I had to put a heat sink on it because it was just getting too hot to touch. Um, it was starting to seize. So the, the, the gears would start to uh, chew the filament and the whole thing would just bind up. So that was a problem. And so obviously the NF Sunrise has been the most reliable hot end that I've used. So I really recommend it. Okay, so what am I printing right now? Well, I'm printing some parts for a Voron. I guess you've probably heard of a Voron. It's a large and complicated 3D printer with a quad, uh, quad gantry leveling system. I'm not sure it's necessary, to be perfectly honest. I think this is possibly a little over complicated. Some of the pieces are very recognizable. This is the front of the, the hot end assembly. And you can see there the nice surface of the glass print bed. You can see also it's shrunk a little around the edges. Uh, can be a problem. Uh, this is printed in ABS, obviously quite a high temperature. And so, yeah, I think by the time you have modified your 3D printer to print the parts for a Voron, I think by that time you don't actually need a Voron anymore. So you might ask yourself, why am I printing it? Well, it's because I'm going to modify my Tronxy a little further. So I'm going to shorten the frame. I'm going to fit 48 volt stepper motors and get that bit of extra speed out of it. I want to give a shout out to Simon Vez of the VZ Bot program. He was the one that inspired me to get more speed out of my Core XY printer. When I started with this, I think my first test print was conducted at 25 millimeters per second. Nowadays, I print reliably at 100 millimeters a second. So it's a little like the story of Burt Munro. I wonder if you remember the movie, The World's Fastest Indian. He was a New Zealander as well. He came from Invercargill and he modified his Indian motorcycle, which was originally capable of about 50 miles per hour. And he improved its speed to about 200 miles per hour and set several world speed records for under 1000 cc motorcycles at Bonneville Salt Flats. So I think the story of my Troxy is much the same. Started off with something that was slow, lumbering, not very reliable and gave pretty rough prints. And I've ended up with something which prints reliably and fast and I, of course, I've got the obligatory benches here, but as you've seen, I use this for quite large industrial prints most of the time. So I'm not really too concerned about detail prints um, on this machine, but with clipper and input shaping, you'd be surprised just how well a large Core XY machine can print. You can see that most of the space in my enclosure is wasted at the moment. It's just used to store filaments. 
so I think it's pretty obvious I don't need the printer to be this tall. I'm looking forward to modifying it further. Oh, I'm Alex. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the section below. And until next time, thanks for watching and all the best with your 3D printing projects.